I see Ms. Green is here. Ms. Green represents Ms. Goddard Heath. And Ms. Green, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if it was my earbuds or not. We were kind of cutting out in and out at the beginning. Okay. If, so if I, I put the microphone a little closer, does that help? Yeah, it's fine now. Okay, great. Good to hear. And then I'll just double check to see if your, your client is on the line. Renisha Goddard Heath, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, well, welcome to you. And then I'll, I'll see if um, Gavin Buchanan, if you're on the line today. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, uh, welcome to you, Mr. Buchanan. All right, so Mr. Buchanan, I, I understand that this is your motion for contempt related to a July 14th episode uh, where you uh, alleged that you were denied uh, visitation time with your daughter, Annabelle. So uh, this is your motion. I'll hear from you first, and then I'll hear from Ms. Green. Okay, so uh, we had a uh, compromise on our our summer visits to be one week on, one week off. And uh, the first three to four visits went okay. And then uh, randomly, the last two uh, did not happen because uh, Annabelle had been bringing some concerns to her mother's attention about maybe being left alone uh, in my care. And so, so, so what you're saying, if I understand, Mr. Buchanan, is that on July 14th, was that the start of your one week on, one week off time frame? No, that was when uh, the visitation started being denied. Okay, so, so on July 14th, tell me what happened. Uh, I, I informed Renesha that I was going to be picking up Annabelle, and she told me that she was not going to be home. Okay. And I had arrived at... Uh, the residence and she was not there and was that was that your your time to start your your week on yes okay what, what day of the week was that friday okay and is, is that what you'd been doing the, that that fifth on the week on week off exchange on fridays yes okay all right and then in your in your motion um just taking a quick look at it Okay, so that that was that was the main allegation I understood from from your motion for contempt. Are, are, are there any other motion or other areas that you're alleging there was a violation? Uh, in our parenting plan, there was supposed to be a mental evaluation for Renisha. It's never happened. And was did you did you type that out in your in your motion for contempt? I'm un, unsure if it's in there or not. I don't remember reading that, so that's why I ask. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's in there. Okay, all right. Anything else you want to tell me about the July 14th allegation? No, just that uh, the visitations were randomly stopped. I would like to know why. Okay. So so then on July 14th, when that visit didn't happen, when was the next time then you, did you have visitation? Uh, two weeks after that, and it was denied again. Okay. All right. All right. Very good, Mr. Buchanan. I'm going to thank you for your input. I'll, I'll hear from Ms. Green. And then if you have any, any rebuttal, I'll have just a moment to share after Ms. Green's presentation. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead, please, Ms. Green. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So Ms. Uh, Goddard, he did stop visitation. She had heard um, concerns of the child's safety and father's care and had contacted CPS regarding those allegations. During the time that there was no visitation, there was an ongoing CPS investigation, and she was advised to seek a protection order, which she did. The protection order was denied because she hadn't presented enough information. Um, it was continued multiple times uh, for a hearing, but ultimately um, we dropped it after CPS had done an investigation with the child at Juliet House um, in Oregon, and the child had uh, not discussed any of the issues that had been brought to the CPS allegations. So during that time, she had a legitimate concern for the child's safety. The child had made comments of physical abuse, uh, neglect, and during the uh, course of the CPS investigation, that was her um, advice as for what to do to prevent any harm from the child occurring. So that is the action she took. Um, I believe that it was uh, well-intentioned based on the concerns and allegations that were brought to her attention. And if your honor read my client's uh, supplemental declaration, um, I apologize. I believe we sent bench copies of our declaration. We weren't aware that Ms. Uh, Goddard had filed one separately when we came on the case. 
And so I'm not addressing that at all because it was not, um, she obviously is not allowed to have two declarations in the court record. Um, but speaking of the court rules, I also want to bring to the court's attention that Mr. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Buchanan, Buchanan. <laughs> I'm not used to having uh, different names, it took me a minute. Uh, Mr. Buchanan also filed a declaration that far exceeded the page limits. Um, if you looked at his reply declaration, it was both late, we received it only a few days ago, um, and also it was 23 pages of a written declaration in response to our client's declaration. Uh, so I would ask the court to exclude that for failing to follow the court rules. Additionally, the declaration is full of hearsay statements from CPS, other people, and comments made about what his partner had witnessed that aren't her written declaration. So I would ask that all that be excluded from the court's consideration since it's not legitimately before the court. Um, but as I said, my client took reasonable measures because of the safety concerns for the child. Uh, since the investigation has completed, visitation has resumed. And so she has taken the appropriate steps to protect the child from being in harm's way, given the recommendations from the state during that investigation period. So given that the motion for contempt was only for the date that Mr. Um, Buchanan brought to the court's light, where um, we would ask that the court deny contempt, there was nothing intentional or um, uh, willful to harm Mr. Buchanan's visitation. It was solely for the safety of the child, given the allegations that had come to light at that time. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Buchanan, just a brief rebuttal. So I, I had also talked to CPS, and they had informed me that uh, nothing was said to Ernesto regarding me uh, being able to have visits with her. Tell me what that means. So CPS had not informed Renisha to stop visitation at all. Oh, That's okay. That's what CPS had told me. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so here the, the allegation is that um, the, the parties were engaging in uh, following the, the parenting plan, which called for basically a 50-50 plan during the summer, uh, basically week on, week off. Um, and that uh, the indication was, the allegation was that Mr. Buchanan was driving to pick up uh, the child um, and uh, an hour from the pickup uh, um, the mother canceled and said it's not going to happen and, and it didn't happen. Um, so then in response, uh, Ms. Goddard Heath indicates that uh, she has some concerns related to the child being left alone and uh, threats allegedly made from the father to the child. Uh, she brought a no contact or protective or protection order uh, that was eventually denied. And there's also um, a child abuse, uh, kind of a formal in, uh, interview of the child, and there were no disclosures made at that time. Um, so, um, so clearly there was uh, there was a denial of the visitation. Uh, then the question becomes if that's a a reasonable a reasonable step uh, given the circumstances. So the the allegations here were uh, that the child was left unsupervised for a period of time. The response to that was that uh, the stepmother was was present outside washing a car, had the baby cam on and was supervising. Uh, there was indications that potentially the children were, were there alone and somebody rang the doorbell, which frightened the children and the like. So and then there was a, an allegation of, of a threat. Um, so uh, a threat of physical harm. So in, in some instances, I, I think that there is uh, oftentimes there, there, it is reasonable to uh, suspend a visitation uh, here. I don't find that that was reasonable, especially given the fact that the note, the protection order was denied and that there were no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to grant the motion for contempt against uh, Ms. Goddard Heath and order a makeup time to occur um, um, at a time of the father's choosing. It has to be a reasonable period of time. My first thought would be that it would be next summer. Um, but that may not be uh, feasible and maybe kind of be lost in, in the passage of time. Um, uh, so we'll talk about that in just a moment. And I will order uh, the, the Ms. Goddard Heath to uh, pay $40 of gas uh, that for the expenditure of the, the time, well, expenditure of the gas money to get up to the visit that was denied. So, Mr. Buchanan, do you have a time frame that you're looking at as far as makeup time? The only thing I can think of with her being in school right now would be every weekend until the time's made up. Okay, so that would be a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so roughly three days and one over one overnight of two overnights. And so that would be over a period of 
three, three and a half or three to four weekends, correct? My calculations are right, seven days. Yeah. And the thing is, we already do every other weekend right now. Okay. Ms. Green. Um, obviously, I think my client would be concerned about losing every weekend. I mean, we can add one weekend in per month um, to make up the time. It obviously will make up the time. Um, I would ask that my client have priority to pick the weekend in case she has any activities or events with the child, though, because they've already been following it every other weekend. So I don't know what um, activities and so forth are scheduled at this point. So rather than having um, father pick which other weekend per month, I would just ask the client, my client, be able to decide. Okay. So I think I, I, I tend to agree that the makeup time should should not be con you know, just like all in a big burst here. So I think it should be one additional weekend per month in October, November, and December. And there'll be a little bit of carryover into January because we'll have, I believe, so we'll have the the Friday, Saturday, two overnights in October, uh, November, and December. That would be six overnights. And then there would be a seventh day in uh, in January. So I'm thinking that should be the, the, the last weekend in October where there's not um, a, a right now a, a scheduled visit to the father for Mr. Buchanan. So Mr. Buchanan, what's, what's with the alternating schedule? Where are you at right now as far as when's your next visit's planned for? So I was supposed to pick her up this Friday, but uh, due to funds, I'm not sure if I'll be able to pick her up this Friday. Okay, so that would be your next one. That would be on the 7th, and then you'd be picking up potentially on the 21st, which is the next, or the 20th, which is October. That's the next week. So potentially the 27th would be an additional makeup weekend okay the last october or last week of october and my only concern is that's the weekend before halloween usually any school carnivals and events and so forth generally happen the child may already be committed or participating in um, i hadn't talked to my client about future visits yet so that'd be my only concern that's why i'm asking that my client be able to pick an additional weekend so um, we would prefer next weekend and it's also concerning i would say that father isn't exercising his visit now that he's planning on having this weekend. Um, he just let the court know. So I don't even know if these makeup visits will occur or not. So, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll order that the, the, the makeup weekends occur the last, uh, last weekend of each month. If the parties come to a different agreement based on the schedules of the children and the like, then, then that, that they can agree to that. But if they cannot agree, then it'll be the last weekend of October, November, and December and then the last week in January for that one additional day. Okay. So Mr. Buchanan, uh, since you prevailed in this motion, generally we have the prevailing party draft just a brief a brief order that des describes what the court ordered today and then uh, uh, distribute it to the parties and to the court. And then the, we would set a date to review it. Uh, is that something that you think you could do? Yeah, it's something I could do. Okay, let's set a presentation date. We'll take a look at, that would be, um, how does the 17th of October look for the parties? That's fine, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Buchanan? That works for me. Okay, so Mr. Buchanan, if you can get that order out to, to Ms. Green by no later than next Tuesday, um, actually, if you can get it to her by Monday the 9th, and then she'll have an opportunity to supply any, any objections, and then we'll be here on the 17th. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, if there's no other issues, that'll conclude that matter for today. Any, any additional items, Ms. Green? No, Your Honor. Mr. Buchanan. Present, we have Ms. Looney representing the state. We okay. have uh, Ms. Corey, the guardian ad litem. We have Mr. Reed present. He represents Ms. Turner. And I see that Ms. Schwantor, there she is. She's here and she's representing um, Mr. Mr. Day. So I'll double check to see if, uh, just for sake of completeness, is Erica Turner. Are you on the line today, Erica? Yes. Okay, welcome to you. And then Donovan Day, are you here today, Mr. or Donovan? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. Welcome to you also. So we're here today. Um, the guardian ad litem filed her report and filed it on the 21st of September. Um, I've read over that and um, and I've read all of the subsequent pleadings that were filed by the parties. Uh, first off, let me just uh, ask if Ms. Corey, if you have any additional comments other than your written report that you filed. Um, I did misspeak in one part of the report regarding the domestic violence evaluation. Um, there was one section where uh, it wasn't ra he wasn't rated low risk. He was uh, rated with average stress coping abilities. 
Um, other than that, this report was primarily about stability um, as far as um, which parent was going to uh, be able to provide a more stable home for Callista. Um, and you know, I can, I can answer to uh, any of the accusations made as well if, um, if you wish. I, I've read I've read everybody's input, so I'm I'm, I'm comfortable having uh, read what people have to say, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more from from the attorneys. Okay. Um, so if if you want to have some time at the end, I'd, I'd be happy to turn some time to you to share uh, any additional thoughts after you've heard from the attorneys. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Looney, I just want to double check with you to see see if you have any any input at this at this point. No, Your Honor, I'm here mainly for the order presentation. Great. All right. Thank you. Maybe we should take care of that first. <laughs> Um, so uh, I didn't, we had a hearing before we get started with the, the, the guardian ad litem report review, there was a hearing on the 12th where several rulings were made. And when I looked yesterday, I didn't see any proposed orders that had been, been filed. Had proposed orders been filed by any of the parties? They, they haven't, Your Honor. We, we prepared proposed orders and uh, unfortunately we weren't able to distribute those until yesterday. Okay. Okay. So those, those have been distributed yesterday. They, so, they weren't. Okay. So then as far as that presentation date, um, we can probably talk about that um, and with, in conjunction with any, any follow-up from the Guardian Ad Litem review. So we'll, we'll kind of choose a date here at the end. We can review both things. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, so here, let's just hear from Mr. Reed as representing the petitioner. You can go first with your, your comments related to the Guardian Ad Litem report, and then we'll hear from Ms. Schwantor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you know, the, the report seems to have several problems. It, it appears to rely on, um, one, Ms. Turner staying in a shelter due to lack of funds. Uh, number two, Mr. Day's account of the conditions of the home at the sale. Uh, three, reports of abuse by Ms. Turner from Mr. Day and his references. And fourth, the child's expressed preference to live with her father. Um, as, as previously expressed in this court, Ms. Turner has struggled financially since the party separation. Mr. Day has profoundly neglected his responsibility to provide support, not just to Ms. Turner, but to his child. This issue could have been cleared up on the closing of the sale of the house by allowing Ms. Turner to access those funds. But in his fiscal comfort, he continues to hold her captive uh, by denying her requests for, for uh, those funds. Um, staying in a shelter is currently her only resolution. That can be fixed once she has access to, to the funds um, from the sale of the house. But uh, again, she just hasn't been able to do that. Uh, the, the report was clearly one-sided. Um, Ms. Corey interviewed Mr. Day and his friends and family all who supported him and trashed Ms. Turner, but either did not interview Ms. Turner's collateral context, contacts or did not consider their comments. Um, not, not, none of her support was expressed in, uh, in the report. Similarly, she interviewed Ms. Turner's former partners who are allied with Mr. Day as his friends, and they gave her a description of Ms. Turner consistent with, with his. There, there was no contact with the child's teachers or other school officials. There was no personal review of the condition of the house, only reliance on Mr. Day and his self-serving comments. Uh, the report indicates the child was asked her preference. The uh, RCW 2612-175 says if a child expresses a preference regarding the parenting plan, the guardian ad litem shall report the preference to the court together with the facts relative to whether any preferences are being expressed voluntarily and the degree of the child's understanding. The GAL did not provide any supporting information at all, simply said she had talked with the child. The child said she wanted to, to live with her father. And she had the GAL had been informed that Mr. Day had expressed that he was bribing the child to make these comments. But the, the instead of, of relying on that, she, she only relied on the, the comments of a six-year-old. Um, the GAL does not appear to give any weight to Mr. Day's acknowledged narcissistic violence toward Ms. Turner. Um, he, he's shown great hubris in, in breaking into our house during, during this and proceeding. None of that was, was, was considered. Uh, there was, uh, as, as Ms. Corey uh, discussed earlier today, there was a uh, reliance on the, uh, the DV evaluation. Um, and, and while that evaluation was, 
uh, was mostly favorable towards Mr. Day, there was still a recommendation that he needs to take, uh, uh, he needs to have counseling, he needs to have uh, take a course, um, he needs to have treatment to to uh, address these issues. Um, and, and that wasn't, wasn't expressed there. Um, if the GAL's recommendation is adopted, this case becomes a relocation. Uh, the, these parties live hundreds of miles apart. None of the factors related to such a dramatic relocation have been considered here. Since the only factors that advantage the child in, in such a relocation relate to the father's already existing financial advantage, which appear, appears to be what Ms. Corey is relying on here, is simply stability, meaning Mr. Day has a better financial advantage than Ms. Corey. Uh, or than Ms. Turner. The, 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 the court really needs to consider that he has already been found neglectful of, of those responsibilities and that, uh, that doing, putting the child with the father under these circumstances would, uh, would take her away from friends and family that she already has in this area, send her to a part of the state where she has no support, no other friends or family other than her father, um, who has already shown his narcissistic attitude and it could be putting the child in considerable danger. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Ms. Schwantor? It looks like the mute button's depressed. Uh, good morning, Your Honor and counsel. Um, I respectfully um, disagree with counsel's assertion. Um, Your Honor, just to, a few issues. In regard to um, the payments, I wanted the court to be aware that uh, my client has uh, made all spousal uh, support payments with the exception of the October payment, which he expects to make by the end of the week. He um, uh, is having the child support garnished from his paycheck. He has paid the court's um, order um, civil fine, as well as the, the $2,000 um, in attorney's fees. Um, so Mr. Day um, is nearly um, up to date with his um, financial obligations um, as ordered by the court. Um, I want to remind the court that Mr. Day, as I understand it, voluntarily um, engaged in a domestic violence um, evaluation, and I will tell the court that he is willing to engage in whatever um, program that the court orders. Um, however, on, on reviewing the, the evaluation, I would ask the court um, not um, order Mr. Day to engage in a, a treatment program. Um, I want to address some of the, the issues that are raised regarding the, the guardian ad litem rep report. Um, First of all, um, my request to the court today is that the court adopt the recommendations um, of the guardian ad litem report. Um, I do not believe there is any demonstrated bias. I believe that there was a thorough investigation. Um, we see on page two that she um, engaged in a number of interviews, a number of uh, collaterals and references for both parties. Um, she reviewed um, police reports, DCYF records. She even reviewed a, a news article, watch reports. Um, she reviewed the domestic violence evaluation. I believe that this was um, an extensive and uh, complete report um, and does not have um, any bias as asserted um, by the petitioner's attorney. Um, I believe that the guardian ad litem appropriately considered um, the criteria that's set forth in 2609-197. Um, the court is to consider the relative strength, nature, and stability of the child's relationship with each parent and which parenting arrangements will cause the least disruption in the child's emotions, emotional stability while the action is pending. The court's then instructed to look at the criteria for establishing um, a permanent parenting plan. And again, the, the factors that stand out here is stability. Um, I believe that what was learned through this guardian ad litem report was that uh, you know, the lack of stability in um, the petitioner's life did not um, begin or, or end with Mr. Day. Um, this is a pattern. She has had um, significant instability um, in her living situation, in her employment situation, and this has impacted the children. Um, so, for example, um, her child Taylor wasn't enrolled in school until the age of 10. Um, Callista didn't attend kindergarten. Um, there are significant concerns um, raised by my client and as well as in this report regarding substance abuse. Um, now, it was helpful that um, that uh, petitioner did provide a, a hair follicle, but I'll tell the court that I don't know I don't know what that means. Does that mean that someone hasn't used marijuana yesterday or two months ago? Um, so it's very difficult to um, evaluate um, and make any sort of conclusion based on that one test alone. And again, I would just ask the court to, to follow um, the, the recommendations of the GEL and have the petitioner engage in an evaluation, um, which would provide some sort of history and report from, from the mother and fully inform the court regarding um, substance abuse issues. Um, the, the father um, provided the court with um, 
through the GAL, uh, you know, the GAL provided the court with information regarding um, what would, um, where the child would go to school if with the father. Um, he would have the child at the local elementary school. She would um, be in aftercare at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, he is fully prepared um, to take on the responsibility. Um, I would also note that, you know, 2609187 asked the court to look at not just past performance of parenting functions, but future as well. And I think, um, again, that the GAL is, is correct um, and that what should happen now for the child's stability is that the child should be placed um, primarily in the, the care of the father. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, the court um, may have. Thank you. Oh, I, excuse me. I'm sorry. I have one more, more comment. Um, sure. It's my position that the, the Relocation Act simply does not apply. Um, those factors are very specific to, um, to a, a parent relocation, a primary presidential parent relocation, not um, an initial custody determination. Um, so the factors that apply here are set forth in 2609197 and 187. Um, so I do not believe that the Relocation Act applies to this, um, this proceeding. Okay, so so give me the reference again for the relocation twenty six. Uh, so the the factors that apply are those yeah. set forth in um, twenty six oh nine one nine seven, which is issuance oh, of a temporary parenting plan, um, which references the twenty six oh nine one eight seven factors in a relocation. It's my position, and I believe that's correct. Is that um, that that law is implicated, and the court is required to engage in a relocation analysis when a primary residential parent is proposing a move for the child. Um, so under this circumstance, the court is making, uh, I would argue, a temporary parenting plan. So we have a temporary parenting plan, correct? That was issued in, on May correct. 2nd. So there's a there. Correct. That's there. And right. so your, your position or argument is that the relocation factors don't apply because- Correct. We follow the residential parent, Your Honor. And in this case, we're, asking, we're making a change in custody. Um, so I believe that that statute is specific to a, a primary residential parent moving. And I believe that that would be supported with the case law, even when we look at, you know, if we have a 50-50 parenting plan, um, you know, we don't look at relocation factors. We look at um, modification factors instead of relocation factors. I would say um, to the court that there are some similarities in the factors. Um, I would not disagree, for example, that, um, you know, the court in making a, a temporary plan should look at, um, you know, the child's relationships um, and child's involvement with surroundings or school or other activities. That's certainly something that the court considers, which is similar to, you know, the, the criteria that's set forth in a, a relocation action. Um, but again, it, they're different. Um, so. Okay. I'm just, I, I yeah. good explanation. I was just taking a, a moment okay. to go over the 2609 statute related to relocation. Okay. Um, I guess I, I should point out um, that in the the um, attorney for the mother mentions that, you know, the, the child had expressed um, a preference to to be with a father, um, but did so without without any reason. But when you look at it, the, the child says, well, my mom yells at me all the time. You know, my dad listens to me. He talks to me. Um, so despite being a child of, of six, um, she certainly was able to, to articulate some reason for her preference. And uh, my client absolutely, absolutely denies that there was any um, any sort of coaching or any sort of gifts or anything like that to, to um, convince the child to say one way or the other. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Reed, any follow-up? Uh, Ms. Schwander has... Um, I've her comments on the, the relocation are, are, are completely valid. Of course, this this is not uh, completely a relocation case. We don't have a, a, a primary parent moving. However, the 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 purpose of having the the factors for relocation um, still relate in this case. We're uh, we're talking about uh, the possibility of moving a child from one part of the state to a completely different part of the state, um, and and it, it would be. Um, uh, it, it would be irresponsible for us to to not consider um, at least the 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 same kinds of, of factors um, in moving that child if that re relates back to the the stability uh, and and uh, environment of the child you know that's fine but uh, again as as I point out the what appears to be the real problem in this case is that father is um, is better able to financially pay for the things that he needs to pay for and mother has relied on him to help her to support her and he has refused to do so. And that appears to be why mom ha has a, a sense of, of instability. <clears throat> Thank you. Before I hear from Ms. Corey, just, I just want to just again focus on that the procedural question as far as 
a, a relocation because kind of you know if if the if the court accepts the recommendation of the guardian ad litem it, it would amount to a, a relocation and so while Ms. Corey's report focuses on the best interest of the child and, and her duties in the guard as a guardian ad litem and while she does cover cover and address some of the relocation factors that's not the focus of the report. The focus of the report is, is more, more broad and maybe not as laser focused as, as the relocation factors would be. And so I guess my question then to the parties is, if we have a temporary parenting plan in place, um, if a guardian ad litem makes a recommendation that there should be a change, which includes relocation, should the court necessarily be focused on those relocation factors and should have the part, should the parties as 2609510 says have an adequate opportunity to prepare and be heard on that issue? So that's my question. Um, Ms. Schwanter, you, you kind of addressed that. And do, anything else you want to sh share on that? And then Mr. Reed, any, I'll hear any comment you might have. Um, no, Your Honor, it continues to be my position that the Relocation Act does not apply to this matter. Um, and I would point the court to um, the factors that are set forth in 260987. Um, and I would, I would note that some of the factors are, are similar. I believe that all the 260987 factors are addressed in the um, report of the, the guardian ad litem. Um, the court notes appropriately that the factors are different. And I would point out that, you know, when you look at a relocation, you're looking at what are the reasons for the relocation? What's the financial benefit to the parties? That clearly the, the statute envisions a very a different factual circumstance than the court has before before you today. Um, and again, my, my position is that um, that the issue of stability um, is the main issue here, as the GAL pointed out, and stability is best achieved by placement with the father. Um, and again, we the mother is still in an insta unstable position. She is currently at a shelter, so she will certainly move again. And will she move to another school district? Maybe, we don't know. And I think that's part of the problem here. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Well, you're in the RCW 2609520 on a basis for relocation. Uh, it, it, it gives us the reason for addressing these factors as that there is one party proposing to relocate with the child um, and and that the, the court needs to be looking at the reasons for for that relocation. Um, it, it doesn't actually say that it is intended for a final parenting plan that is now being modified. It, it, it is simply it, one parent is is looking to relocate with the child. And so I think that the factors, they still have have weight here. Um, Ms. Schwanders indicates that, well, they're they're mostly the same. Um, I don't think they're mostly the same. I think there are some some similarities between the two. Um, but one one very important factor that the relocation statute brings up is uh, the disruption, uh, not just with the child, but with the the, the relationship between the child and the parents. Um, this child has always lived with her mother, and and there would be a, a severe disruption. Yes, there have been moves, but because the party sold their house, that was going to happen. Um, the fact that there's going to need to be another move is is only again only related to the fact that dad has not been willing to help uh to mom to financially uh support that move um one of the factors in in uh, 2609 520 is whether there was a prior agreement of the parties that exists in in 187 as well um and the agreement of the parties up to this point has been that the child would live with her mother um uh, considering all the factors that the on on both both statutes i think i think the court has to to look at um whether this is going to be disruptive to this child if if she is forced to move back with uh, her father to a location where she has never lived and and where she is simply unfamiliar and that there is just nobody there to to support her and help to take care of her other than her father who as i've indicated before has already expressed severe control issues thank you mr reed Ms. corey it's without fail uh, i apologize um when when i say stability in this report i'm not just referring to financial stability, I'm referring to emotional stability for this child. Um, a lot of concern after I spoke with um, the parents of Ms. Turner's other children and learned that twice she had left with no notice to those parents. Um, she still has no parenting plan in place with the uh, son um, and the custody to for the children for the older daughters was um, due to the lack of her stability at the time. Um, so it's it's not just a financial thing. It's um, uh, you know uh, 
stability across the board. All right, thank you, Corey. As well, I did also have um, some concerns with the substance abuse issue, which I actually didn't learn of until late in the investigation. Um, in the intake that uh, Ms. Turner filled out for me and signed as true, um, she states that her only, um, I ask, have you ever used drugs? And she replies, yes. If yes, what drugs have you used? And she replies, CBD, and that she only uses them occasionally. Um, if that's true, I, I think that would be great, but um, I have no evidence of that at this point. And um, she said one thing, the witnesses said another. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, with with regard to the guardian ad litem report, you know, I, I think guardian ad litem reports are are somewhat difficult. The guardian ad litem is put in this position where they need to contact and hear from both sides. Um, they hear from both sides and the designated people that the parties have uh, indicated. This this is my reference. Please talk to them. And I, I think most most guardian ad litems try to be uh, even handed in the amount of time and the number of people that they interview or talk to on on both both sides. Um, so and I, so I can see where Ms. Um, where Ms. Turner is is coming from, where she might feel that you know, based on the information that those parties have shared, uh, that there's not follow up uh, investigation to, into things that are learned during those during those interviews. Uh, the, the, my understanding with guardian ad litem reports is that they they speak with the people um, and they gain information from them and they report that information to the court. It's uh, while there may be times where there may may, may be important to do some follow up investigation. Uh, that's not always not always the case and not always required. A lot of the times it's just taking that information, receiving it and packaging it and presenting it to the court in, in a recommendation and the factual basis for their for their statements. Um, and so, in a perfect world, we would have all kinds of guardian ad litems and all kinds of monies to pay for them and all types of hours to pay for them. Uh, that's not the world we live in, unfortunately, and because these are very important issues and the uh, monies are just not simply allocated for for them at this point. So I wanted to just share that, that, that viewpoint uh, as far as my viewpoint of the Guardian Adam reports. The Guardian Ad Litem points out the, the main concern, which has been emphasized by both uh, Ms. Schwanter and Ms. Corey, uh, that the stability is the, the, the main thing that uh, leads to their recommendation for, for a change. Um, Mr. Reed uh, makes a very good point that, you know, uh, lack of income or a lack of finances should not be the controlling factor uh, of, of, of a parent-child relationship and a determination of, of custody. Um, I think it's important to note that it sounds like um, Ms. Uh, Turner has made a, a decided decision to spend as much time with her children, doing things with her children as possible, and putting on the back burner creating income. Uh, I think that's borne out through her activities with volunteering at the school and with her statements to Ms. Corey related to when it's convenient for her to work, she'll, she, she will work. Uh, so while some of the, the financial stability uh, could be increased by more work, there's been a, a decision uh, by Ms. Turner not, not to do that um, because she places emphasis or preference or importance on, on other things. So my, my big question in, 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 in addressing this issue is that you know the guardian ad litem report makes a recommendation that's that's a big change. It's a big change. The recommendation. It's moving a, a seven-year-old girl from the home, the community that she's known for most of her life, to a new community. Um, and there's lots of good reasons for that. Miss Corey, and that's you know gives gives voice to many of those reasons. Um, so the, the, so that's that's where my concern comes from. Is that where here we don't have one party petitioning the court for a relocation. Uh, we don't have that. So we don't have that rebuttable presumption that says if you're a primary parent, you get you get kind of the nod, you're in the lead, and you're likely going to be allowed to relocate. Here we have a, 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 a non-custodial parent who is relying upon the re a review of information from the guardian ad litem and kind of tagging onto that and saying, yeah, we like that. Let's do that. Uh, let's make the move now. And so when I look at that, what the decision to make on this, when I think about the relocation factors, although they are 
um, more or less addressed or, or touched upon or alluded to in the Guardian Ad Litem report. There's not that kind of a laser focus where you go down and you say, okay, these are the 11. Okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, factor number three, which is the disruption of contact between the child and the person seeking the, the relocation and whether that's good for the child or detrimental for the child. There's not as much maybe uh, information or thought or, or ink uh, given to that. On the other hand, I also think that the Guardian Ad Litem Review it has been presented. Uh, how much more information do we do we need than what the parties have shared and what the Guardian Ad Litem has shared? Um, and also take into account finances, finances of, of bringing another motion to court and how that impacts the parties. So I'm sensitive to that also. The information that we have is that there's stability issues uh, in the mother's home. That's that's the information that's coming from Ms. Corey and from Ms. Schwanter and her client. Um, what I'm not hearing is that there's any imminent risk to, to Callista, to the child. I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing that there's imminent risk. Um, while there may be greater stability with the father, um, I'm not hearing that there's a, in the current living arrangements, uh, while they may not be stable and there's inherent instability, you know, just because kind of living on the edge without funds and uh, moving and the like and other issues that were raised in the report, um, and that she may be getting an apartment soon if she gets some money through child support. Um, so because of those things, I, I don't think I'm going to make a change today. Um, I'm not going to make a change as far as the parenting plan because I, I would, I would, because it is a significant issue, I would feel more comfortable if we had the specific information related to the 11 factors. Uh, if there's a, a motion to change custody, which that very well may be Mr. Uh, Mr. Day's next step is to ask for that and move the court for that then he could enunciate clearly his reasons why he feels that that's appropriate. And Ms. Turner can enunciate her reasons why she feels that's not appropriate. The guardian litem could certainly chime in on that more directly than she already has. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna hold off on, on that specific issue. However, I am gonna uh, provide some interim rulings related to um, an SED evaluation or substance use disorder evaluation uh, for both mother and father. I think both need to have that evaluation completed and if there's any recommended treatment, get started on it. Um, I will adopt the recommendation of our family wizard. That should be started soon. Each party will have to sign up and you pay your fair share. I, I think it's half or whatever it is. Um, so that, yeah, each party will pay pay their, their portion. Um, and I also think it would be appropriate, and I, and I see no downside to this, uh, that both uh, mother and father complete some parenting classes. So for the father, love and logic, he should complete that, sign up, take that. And for mother, she should take the parents in between class. I think those recommendations are well taken and, and can be implemented now and it'll be a provide benefit to the child. But as far as the bigger, more salient, weighty issue, as far as moving the child from this county to uh, Richland, Washington, uh, that's, I think we need to have a more focused discussion on on some of those factors that are related to the relocation. So if the parties want to bring that in the future, we could certainly address it. But today I'm going to hold off. So that's kind of where we're at. So there's kind of these interim, maybe smaller pieces that were ordered today. Um, uh, the, I guess I could, since no party is really a moving party, then I could probably draft that and then just submit that uh, and send a copy to the party. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, so I'm just going to give myself a note here. You already have a specific requirement as to the uh, type of uh, SUD evaluation. Tell me more. Tell me what that. Uh, uh, for example, is is it uh, hair follicle? Is it nails? Um, a, a twelve panel dude. So, so my understanding with a, a substance use disorder or a substance abuse evaluation, that's principally done through. A, conversation with the individual and any collateral input that could come from Ms. Corey or, or, or the other party. It, and my understanding and experience has been that they don't necessarily uh, resort to a UA or to hair follicle. If that's part of their, their normal process, obviously that would be required, but uh, my understanding is that's not not common. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Ms. Corey, did you have a, a point to make? Uh, no, just to ask that there be collateral input for both. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's appropriate. I'll include that in the order, Ms. Schwanter. And as to the domestic violence treatment program for Mr. Day? My understanding is that he's he's in, engaged in that, or is he's, he not engaged? He's completed the evaluation, Your Honor. Okay. And so the, there's been no start to that? Of the not situation? yet, Your Honor. Not yet. Okay. 
And I think that the um, similar to my reasoning with the, the class, the love and logic, the parents in between classes, I don't see any downside to the child. Um, I see upside to the child uh, for a uh, father engaging in in the recommended treatment. It's a six month period uh, of, of treatment. It's, it starts heavy and it, and it gets thinner or as far as amount of time uh, in class as the time as the class goes on. So I think that that's appropriate um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll require that. Okay, so I will get that order out to the parties today um, and I'll get, that'll be filed and uh, any additional items before we break today. Uh, we still need a new date for the uh, existing temporary order. So you said you need a, a, a new date for the existing temporary order? Yeah, for, for entry of the, yeah. You, you, you had put that off to the end. Yes, thank you for the, the September 12th date uh, that we had had the hearing. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that. So let's take a look at the, the calendar. Uh, Mr. Reed, since you, it sounds like you you got those sent out at Ms. Um, we will have those, I would assume, shortly. 17th of October, Tuesday. How's that look for the parties? Uh, no objection. Morning, that uh, looks Your good. Honor, Thank you. And of course, Mary, I do represent the, the petitioner in this matter and the moving party to the motion before you today, namely Jenica Lemons. I think starting uh, from an initial threshold, we're in a spot with the parenting plan that is largely agreed. Uh, my client, who informs you in her initial motion and declaration that she's been the primary caretaker of these kids. Uh, for the majority of their lives, uh, parties since separation, that's uh, continued. Uh, it looks like both parties are agreeable to the schedule in which my client has proposed, which is for maintaining that role of the primary caretaker, uh, continuing in the homeschool application, which she's been doing for seven years, and Mr. Uh, Lemons enjoying visitation with the three kids, uh, Isaac 17, Declan 15, and Donnie 6, uh, three weekends per month uh, from Friday to Sunday. A couple of uh, more minor issues related to that and some technical issues on that parenting schedule. Uh, number one is the exchange location uh, and time. Uh, my client details for you that uh, these kids are doing exceptionally well uh, with homeschool. Uh, they're doing exceptionally well and they're uh, starting to plan, especially the older two kids, career paths and such. Um, but she tells you church is important to this family. It always has been important to this family. Now she tells you, and, and again, it's largely undisputed, that the church family is a kind of an extension of the kids' uh, social life and social activities, uh, that they have uh, friends there that they look forward to seeing, that they do things uh, uh, with these people uh, through these activities, and the kids look forward to that social aspect of church. And I, I think that's positive. Uh, there's been some you know, issue as to how, we, how, how that's played out in the form of a parenting plan. My client tells you since separating in March that she has traditionally uh, picked the kids up on Sunday mornings uh, taking them to church, let them participate in that. And she asked that that continues. And again, given the circumstances, the fact that these people have been separated for nearly six months, this has been the arrangement. Uh, we're asking that you uh, order uh, through the parenting plan that the kids are able to attend church uh, with my client on Sunday so that Mr. Lemons would otherwise have them. Does she, does, does she return the children on Sunday? I think it depends. I think sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't, just based on the activities and the after church uh, functions. Uh, again, I think she's willing to allow that if, if the court so chooses. I think her primary focus is just that the kids can attend and participate in those activities as they've always known. Does church start at 9, 10, go for two hours? That's a great question. I'm assuming it's that 10 o'clock range, but my client's not here. She's not online. I, I can certainly... Uh, get information from her on the start time of that and report back to Ms. Dennis. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so that's the first request. Second request as it pertains to uh, Isaac, who's the 17 year old uh, Isaac, and I'll, I'll get to some of the concerns about the 191 factors here momentarily. Isaac's at an age now where he's a young man. Uh, he's 17. He's coming into his own. And we do ask for some limited, and, and again, I don't anticipate this is going to be abused or a problem, but we do ask for some limited input for Isaac as it pertains to that schedule. Of the three kids, Isaac has been the one that's had somewhat of the conflict and run-ins with dad. Uh, there's been some butting of heads and Isaac is the child who has unfortunately been privy and seen the most of the alcohol consumption and some of those issues uh, with dad in the past. We are asking for some limited input uh, pertaining to the schedule for Isaac. If he wants to go out with friends, if there's something he has uh, planned on a weekend, we're asking he'd be allowed to do so. And given the fact that he's nearly at the age of majority, we certainly think that is uh, reasonable given the circumstances. 
along dove lining in that as well we're asking for some 191 uh, restrictions uh, pertaining to alcohol abuse you have somewhat of a minimization uh, effort by mr lemons to again not accurately uh, detail his significant history with alcohol usage my client tells you and it's again not disputed it's just minimized uh, that this has been a nearly 20 year history of alcohol abuse so to the fact of last year about this time mr lemons recognizing that uh, vowing to change uh, voluntarily seeking some treatment options and basically walking away from work for a period of time so that he could again uh, obtain sobriety because as he says it was killing him he stays sober for six months to his credit my client has concerns that he has relapsed and that was back in the spring we have no idea where the efforts are on that right now my client is confident and and again we, we think this is a credit to mr lemons that he is not currently uh, drinking when he has the children and we would just ask for a prohibition uh, inside that parenting plan which states that he is to not consume alcohol during his time with the kids or immediately prior to that i would identify that within eight hours of any regularly scheduled visit and uh, again given the circumstances uh, we certainly believe that is appropriate that's the parenting plan as it uh, pertains to finances this is where the parties have uh, a difference of opinions now, my client details for you that since the party separated in March, Mr. Lemons has been extremely reluctant to provide any form of financial support. Uh, she's been able to kind of bridge the gap and pay what's required of her on her uh, quite modest uh, wages from uh, being a freelance photographer. This has been her busy season. We're now getting out of that. She does graduation. She does senior pictures. She does weddings. She does traditionally uh, good weather type uh, uh, productions. Uh, when the weather is good, uh, her business picks up. Her business picking up, again, given the fact that she's homeschooling three active kids, is hampered by the fact she can only do this on the weekends. We were somewhat surprised to get Mr. Lemon's uh, responsive pleadings that said, oh, we're making the exact same amount of money. When the tax records, the income information, uh, everything that both parties provided you under seal since these parties separated and we filed back in May does not indicate that. Mr. Lemons does the taxes. Mr. Lemons has uh, always done the taxes. Mr. Lemons has signed off on those being accurate uh, and reasonable based on the income and the information he had. And that information shows that my client usually takes home about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars per year. If you factor that she's only working primarily weekends through the summer and the late spring and early fall, again that resonates and that makes uh, that makes sense given the circumstances. She's then at home homeschooling the kids and doing activities for them. Uh, so again, we do believe that in addition to child support, you know, spousal maintenance is appropriate. My client has proposed a very reasonable number. Child support for three kids alone, if we take Mr. Lemon's income and his proposed worksheets, is about $1,400 per month. We're asking for an additional $600 on that towards what we would deem family support. We can break it out as child support for $1,400, $600 for uh, spousal too. I think it gets us to that same required destination of $2,000 per month. And again, given the circumstances, we believe that's reasonable. I would point out to the court um, some of the debts. And again, I think those are articulated and I think largely agreed. There's the home mortgage of uh, the house uh, in Kelso, which is about uh, $1,400 per month to $1,600 per month. Uh, my client is willing to pay that, provided she gets the child support and the spousal support as we have requested. And again, given the incomes, so we think that's appropriate. Mr. is employed as a millwright for West Rock. Now, he earns, according to my analysis, just a hair over $73,000 per year. I think the uh, recent wage information provided through pay stubs reflects that. I don't see any drastic changes between the tax returns from 2022 and in addition to the most recent information provided by Ms. Dennis. That's the income we've used for him. That puts him at a gross of $6,090 per month. What I would point out to the court is Mr. Lemons has ambitions to retire by the time he's 50. He has been, he's, uh, I believe, 41 or 42 years old now. He has been plugging significant amounts towards his voluntary 401k contributions. He's putting in about $1,000 per month. So if you back out that uh, money from the 417, which is allowed by statute, again, that puts an additional $600 in his pocket that he freely puts towards the, that retirement uh, that should be uh, calculated back into his net wages. We attempted to do that on our proposed child support worksheets. That's reflected. So again, if you look at the contrast uh, of earnings, if you look at the amount of parenting time my client has, if you look at the fact that she has currently put all of her career aspirations on hold so that she could pursue her husband's dreams over the 22 years that they were married, 
again, the request for $2,000 per month is, is, is reasonable given the circumstances. My client details for you. And I want to ask you a quick question, Ken, before you get to, sure. before you leave finances. Uh, it looks like um, Mr. Mr. Lemons provided some deposit information, you know, $130,000 of deposits. Can you help me understand your client's position on that? No, I can't because that was just recently provided to us on his reply. I think there is a significant amount of discovery that needs to be done on this case. And the hard part is I think everybody's aware on a temporary basis, you come in for uh, orders and you don't have the full amount of information on that. I think that's something we're going to have to do. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe either party has sent out interrogatories or requests for production. We're going to have to have that come out in the wash. But I can uh, certainly tell you that my client is not earning $130,000 per year from a a very part-time freelance photography business. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, So again, looking at the the circumstances of that, we do believe that our request is appropriate. Uh, Our asking for a contribution towards attorney's fees and costs. Uh, My client has asked anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 towards those. Uh, She believes that is reasonable. Uh, given the financial disparity uh, that the two parties have and the fact, and this is uh, again, something that uh, we don't see irregularly in this uh, line of work, uh, unfortunately, but she's gone without support since these parties separated in the spring. Uh, Mr. has made it abundantly clear. He has no intentions to pay uh, support until it's court order. He's made it clear to her what his stance is on child support and alimony. And true to his word, he has just refused to provide my client uh, with anything up until this point. We did attempt settlement negotiations. Uh, we did send out, as, as we detail for you, uh, global resolution back in July. To date, we have not heard back. I certainly don't put that onus on Ms. Uh, Dennis. I think our offices work well together and, and, and always have. I think, again, this is just a measure of, I don't wanna pay support and I wanna uh, shirk my financial responsibilities and this is how I'm going to do this. We brought this motion as a last resort uh, because again, of Mr. Lemons dragging his feet on financially supporting his family and his wife of 22 years. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. Oh. Was I clear enough on that? Is it might coming through okay on the audio? Oh yeah, the audio is great. Audio is great. Thank you. All right, we'll turn the time to Miss Dennis, please. Miss Dennis. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm going to keep it fairly brief because I know you've read a lot of materials on this case. Um, so just on the parenting plan, um, we agree on the same three issues. Essentially, um, there is the issue of whether or not there should be included in the order that the kids go to church with mom on Sunday. Uh, My client does not agree to having that in the parenting plan. He has said if the older two kids want to go to church, he's not going to stand in their way. That's something they can work out with their mom. Um, But essentially to require that they go to church every single weekend um, takes away basically his whole Sunday. So half of his weekend. Um, And then the other thing is there has, as of recently, there has been some conflict around the pickups and the transfers um, that has not been great for, I think, either party or the kids. So he doesn't want that included in the orders, but he will obviously allow the older two kids to go if they want to. Um, And I assume, I mean, if the younger one asks, I don't think he would say no either. Um, As far as Isaac goes um, and, you know, whether or not he gets a say in the parenting plan and the client would disagree with that as well. Um, I don't think he would disagree with, you know, if Isaac wants to go spend time with his friends or something like that. But during dad's parenting time, that's something that Isaac needs to work out with his dad, who's his caretaker during that weekend. And I think that's reasonable. Um, Just like when he's with mom, he would work that out with his mother. Um, And as far as the 191 issues, um, my client denies the history of alcohol use as outlined in his materials. Um, He does say that he basically doesn't drink at all for the last year um, for health reasons. He agrees with a term in the parenting plan that neither party will drink when they have the kids. He's fine with that. He's not drinking when he has the kids now. Um, I don't think that there is enough evidence here to order any kind of treatment or 191 factors. Um, The fact is they've been separated for many months. Mom does refer to a past problem, which again, he denies, but there's nothing over the last several months where there's been any problems with this agreed parenting plan that they've already been following since separation. And I think the fact that there haven't been issues, no one has been to court in all of those months, um, we're here now, um, but I don't think that you know, that shows that there really weren't any issues with the parenting plan. Um, I think even now they're largely agreed on the parenting plan with the exception of these few minor details. So I think that speaks to the fact that, you know, that alcohol issue is really, it's a non-issue right now. So I think that he would agree to including that neither party drinks on their residential time, but I don't think we actually need formal 191 factors in that parenting plan. Um, As far as the financials go, um, again, I mean, We have submitted all those materials. Um, You know, we submitted her bank account that showed that 130,000 in deposits. Um, That was with his response. She didn't even touch on that in her reply declaration. Um, She did provide her year to date 
recorded income that's about 50,000. The issue here is that she's self-employed in an industry where she does receive income in other forms, you know, Venmo, cash, all these things that aren't necessarily reported on their tax return, which yes, they both sign their tax return. I think we're all very aware that sometimes self-employed people, it's not unusual to kind of massage your tax information. So maybe what you're actually taking home is not really what you're telling the IRS. Um, so I think without any explanation, I mean, $130,000 is a lot of money. Um, and she was getting that somewhere. So I don't think that until she can show her actual income or explain where she got that $130,000, I don't think she has any need for spousal support because based on those deposits, she's earning more than he is. Um, I think we also need to look at her expenditures. You know, we look at her accounts and her business accounts. I mean, she's running all kinds of personal expenses through those business accounts. So even that, you know, if she's claiming those are business expenses. I mean, we're looking at uh, you know, church, sports, entertainment, eating out, all of these things, which have nothing to do with a photography business. Um, so I don't think that she's able to demonstrate that she has a need for spousal support. Um, I think that given those deposits, my client is probably being a little bit generous by just assuming that her income is roughly equal to his at about 6000 And I think for now, it makes sense to just put them both at about that 6000 net that he was proposing, order child support at the standard calculation, um, and deny the spousal support request and also deny the attorney fees request. Thank you, Ms. Dennis. One question I have for both parties. There was, Mr. Zandi raised the issue of as far as exchange location. It's not so much the location, it, 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 it's it's tied into the Sunday morning thing, right? And so it's I, there was some concern that coming to the house, and I think the father's request was that that exchange not happen at the house on Sundays, right? Yes. And I think they agree on that. I think they agree to a neutral location. I don't think either one of them wants the other one coming to their house. So I, I think we can include that. And I, I think Mr. Zandy and I can probably pick a neutral location between ourselves. And I, I guess I'm kind of neutral on that. This isn't the typical case you see where these people are at each other's throats. They're not. I mean, they've, they've gotten to this point. They've been fine. My client, again, was somewhat surprised to um, learn that uh, Mr. Uh, Lemons had some kind of uh, uh, issue or recollection of there being problems. My client doesn't really see that. I would agree with the court. I think this is the uh, Sunday time uh, as the issue. Mr. Lemons has relied on his uh, folks for some of these exchanges. Uh, and, and again, I think they're doing better than probably 80% of the parties that we see uh, at temporary orders. And my client's neutral to that. If you want a uh, uh, public exchange location, we're fine with that. If you want to keep the status quo, we're, we're also fine with that. Okay. I appreciate the input. Thank you. Okay. Um, so largely, as the parties have indicated, the parenting plan is, is agreed. The parties established a pattern uh, during their married life, and it sounds like they're pretty much saying, let's continue with that. So the mother, uh, Ms. Lemons, will be de designated as the primary custodial parent. Uh, the father will have his time um, with the children on the first, second, and fourth uh, weekends uh, on Friday, and the parties didn't specify a time, so it sounds like there's some flexibility there. Um, was there a specific time that the parties were looking at? I know we just submit, Judge, as far as the first, second, and fourth weekends, that's kind of in flux based on when my client has photo shoots and they've done a good job. I think if we just leave it at the three weekends per month, we can kind of figure out what those are, because I think that's going to not necessarily gel real well with itself over time. Yeah, specifically the hour, the, the, the time of commencement and time of ending. Leave that open, Ms. Dennis, any ideas on that? I think that's fine. If the parties need a specific time, I think we can resolve that just amongst ourselves too. Okay, great. So let's make it the, the first, second, fourth weekends, Friday through Sunday. There's also a request for a Tuesday evening. I didn't hear any objection to that. Uh, so we'll allow the Tuesday evening visit to occur weekly. Um, it should be a neutral public exchange location, not at either party's home. Um, as far as the alcohol restriction, um, I mean, I'm going to include a 191 restriction in there. It sounds like the, the drinking was a was an issue for a number of years. I don't know how exactly long it was, but at least for a period of time, it was it was it was an issue. And it sounds like, to Mr. Lemon's credit, he's gone for a long period of time and maybe recently relapsed. But uh, old habits uh, sometimes die hard, so I will include the 191 restriction related to father's alcohol consumption. That during any residential time, there'll, there'll be zero consumption of alcohol, and that uh, also not no consumption eight hours prior to the, the visitation start time. As far as the uh, the Sunday morning, 
Um, it sounds like the parties have established a pattern throughout their married life also in, in the their their faith expression where they they as a family or at least the children and the mother went to church on a regular basis and it sounds like that's tied into the the homeschooling so I know a lot of churches have homeschooling groups and so that may be part of what Mr. Sandy is saying so I think for now and until the the guard, guardian ad litem investigates and that's what I'm, I'm going to put a guardian ad litem for the sole purpose of the, the Sunday morning church thing and that'll be the only purpose that the guardian ad litem will be appointed for so it'll be discreet it'll be a 60 40 split uh, for the father paying that 60 percent and the mother pay 40 percent on the on the sole issue of of, of church attendance uh, on Sunday morning and how that's to be worked out um but so so for as far as the, the children's religious expression, uh, they've they've attended church in the past, and it sounds like they're wanting. Well, one of the parties is asking that they continue to to do that. Uh, so I think that's fine at this point with um, the three children that they they can go to church with with mother on Sunday mornings, and they should be returned after a reasonable time to the father. So you know the sense is is that if church starts at ten, maybe there's a service for an hour, maybe there's some social time afterwards, uh, then the children would be returned to the father after. Uh, a reasonable period after the services have concluded and a reasonable time frame for uh, sociality afterwards. Um, so, so the guardian ad litem will just be appointed for that single purpose. We have a guardian ad litem list and I'll just ask the parties to chime in if you want to strike any of the next three uh, guardian guardians. Twyla Corey. So we have Twyla Corey. Heather Kale. And Heather Kale. Amy Turnbull. And Amy Turnbull. So we'll turn to the petitioner's counsel first, Mr. Zindi. All right, I'm fine with any of those three, Judge. Okay, Ms. Dennis. I think you said you're fine with any of those, but the, the mute button was on. Yes, I am fine with either or any of those three. Yes. Great. I'll point Twyla Corey uh, for that sole purpose. Um, so related to uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac is at a point where the, the parental ties are necessarily being stretched and extended um, at a child that's 17 there's more autonomy there's more independence and that's that's the right way to go that's what happens when kids get to that age um, so i think there should be some some limited input slash control of isaac with his uh, where he chooses to spend his time obviously the time spent with his father is important uh, and he should have on a, 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 some some limited degree of control you know say like on friday night he wants to go see a movie with some friends or there's a football banquet or there's a football game he wants to go to intend with his friends. I, I think there should be some flexibility for that uh, as that's just part of, of growing up uh, and for the, the loosening of parental ties. Um, so then as far as the, the incomes and, and the support, um, it's, you know, we are very early in this process. It sounds like as far as interrogatories and discovery, that's where at the get-go stages, it sounds like. Uh, so there's always concerns related to pinpointing exactly how many dollars are coming in for a self-employed person. It's it's always squishy. It's always squishy and very difficult to determine. Um, the the deposits that gives me some pause. Um, obviously, there there's some dollars flowing in, and I'm not exactly sure where they're coming from. If they're transfers or if these are lump sum payments from an inheritance or who knows. There's a, lots of explanations. Um, However, you know, if you were to take uh, the father's income if, and if the mother's income was that 130000 I think that there would be more manifestations of, of that within their finances. And I'm, maybe I'm not necessarily seeing that so clearly. It may be there and I may be missing it. Nonetheless, I'll set the father's net income at $6,000 per month. I'll set the mother's net income at 2800 You know, it, it sounds like her, her gross income right now or gross receipts are about $50,000. And both parties are aware of that in the past tax years. Uh, so given that, and uh, I think for a period of time that there should be some uh, spousal support um, as there is kind of a, this transition period. Uh, so I will set the, the spousal, the family support, which includes child support and which includes the spousal support uh, of $1,900, $1,900 to be paid. And that should start in uh, October, October 1. Uh, it sounds like there's no issue as far as as far as the mother staying in the home. Uh, she'll be responsible for uh, paying the mortgage, and so she'll be she'll receive the funds likely from father, and then pay that down or pay that. Then, um, as far as our family wizard, I think there was a request for that. I had that in my notes. That's fine. We, okay. we agree. So we'll, agree. we'll oh, great. Thank you both. We'll include that. That both should use that. 
And as far as attorney fees, I think there is somewhat of a disparity of income. And so I will award, uh, require $1,500, $1,500 from, from father to mother that should be paid within 60 days of today's date. And I think those are the issues that the parties raised. Let me ask if there's any clarification or questions. One quick clarification. Again, we're in October. Can the court reserve on past uh, support arrearages that might be owed since the party separated last spring? Ms. Dennis, did you say I, last, 23 or 22? 23. 23. Um, um, I agree on reserving on that. Um, I think more information is needed to show whether or not what has been paid. Okay, let's do that. There'll be specific reservation on that issue on back, on back support. If there are no, yes, thank you. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt. Presentation in three weeks, I'll be out on the 17th. Ms. Dennis, are you available on the 23rd or is that the 23rd? 24th. Uh, 24th, yes, I'm available. Great, let's set it for that date. Thank you both for that. Very, very good, thank uh, you. October 24th, so 9 a.m. will be the date for presentation. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hilton's motion for temporary order, so Mr. Zandi's representing her and that. So I'll hear from Mr. Zandi first and then from Ms. Dennis. And thank you, Your Honor. Sports where I do represent the respondent in this matter, but the moving party to the motion before you today, namely uh, Katie Hilton. Uh, my client is the current wife of the petitioner uh, and the mother of a soon to be 17 year old child, Logan, who attends uh, school in Kalama. Logan is not the biological son of uh, Mr. Hilton, uh, but the two have a very close relationship. And I, I think it's fair to say that Logan loves Mr. Hilton as a father-like figure. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at on this. This is an eight-year marriage. Uh, parties were married on July 11th of 2015, and I recently separated on August 1st of this year. And since that time, uh, certain agreements, or we thought certain agreements had, be, had been reached, the parties were operating under one sort of circumstance that has recently changed, which has uh, promulgated uh, this motion. My clients before the court today asking uh, largely on uh, two significant areas of concern. Uh, number one is the temporary, and again, that's that's a big term, temporary use uh, and possession of the family home, because this is one where long term on a permanent basis, it looks like there's going to be uh, potential litigation on the character of this home. And, and again, we'll have to uh, decide that and uh, ferret that out through discovery and request for production. My client is asking for the home on a temporary basis, and she's also asking for the spousal support moving forward on this. And, and I'll get to the, the incomes here momentarily. As it pertains to the house, and, and you've got significant information that was provided by my client, uh, especially in her SIR reply uh, to what we received uh, from uh, Mr. Hilton, I would point out, start by pointing out that all information before you, and by my count, there's five different forms uh, that confirm or at least uh, verify my client's position that this home is a community. This is a very nice home. This is 2,800 square feet plus. It's in a very desired area in Kalama, and we anticipate this as well over a million dollar home these, these parties have resided in. So it was acquired during the marriage. I think if you look at the documentation, and Mr. Hilton is very quick to point out that, well, it's it's my separate property, and I just essentially want uh, my wife of eight years and her 16-year-old uh, son gone, uh, and they can go someplace else. But if you look at the information that was provided, I think it's very clear. And the court's uh, obligated to look at the intent of the parties and consider that. And the easiest way to do that is to look at what was recorded. And we've got five different um, five different documents, uh, again, all recognized that show that this uh, home is community. If you look at the deed that's on record with the county, and again, that was uh, back on November 5th of 2021, states deed is listed in both parties' names as owners and for consideration to create community interest. Prior to that, uh, in August of 2019, there's a there was a prior deed that was never reported, but you have the same information. And again, this was signed by Mr. Hilton. States, uh, again, to create a community interest. If you look at the excise tax document, again, dated separately from the prior two we're discussing, it states in capital letters to create community interest. Now, my client is on the home equity line of credit. She is on the mortgage. These parties have lived in this home for a period of time. They've made improvements. They've made it to theirs. Uh, by all intents and purposes, this is community. Fast forward, and, and the parties uh, separate in the summer. What does Mr. Hilton do? Now, he takes the trailer and moves out. He goes and lives with, uh, we believe, his father for a period of time, 
We believe eventually he resided with a, a close friend of his for a period of time, but he was out of the house leaving my client and Logan there for a period of about six or seven weeks. It wasn't until he gets wind that uh, of my involvement and that we're going to bring a, a motion that all of a sudden he says, I'm going to live back in the family home. He went so far during the separation in which he was residing elsewhere that he changed the ring doorbell camera. They took it off. And we have no idea why. We're also requesting that an order be entered that he uh, give that back and not uh, basically, uh, for lack of a better term, mess with that. And that's a home safety uh, feature that my client uh, enjoys and uh, obviously makes her feel uh, more suited at the residence. But he's doing all of these actions which show that, okay, you can live in the home. I'm going to live elsewhere. My client details for you that her understanding was that was going to happen until Logan graduated from high school. Uh, she understood that that was, again, largely agreed, understood that once we figure out what the character of this home is, what the transfer is, and this divorce can be finalized, that that was going to be the arrangement. It wasn't until he moves back in that now all of a sudden he said, well, it's my home and I want you out. And so so that's the, you know kind of leaves a little bit of a sour taste in my client's mouth and rightfully so. Fast forward to this. And again, in his response, it's interesting. Now you see a complete change in demeanor. He even goes so far as suggesting, again, we're talking about a child who was immersed in high school, doing very well, who was a step uh, child to Mr. Hilton. What does he suggest? He said, well, I wanna live in this giant million dollar home, just me and my dog. And I want Katie, my wife of eight plus years and my stepson, whom I love and who loves me as a parent, a parental figure, they can go move and live in Rainier with Katie's mom and dad. That's not really appropriate. That certainly isn't reasonable. So when he tells for you in his declaration that, well, I've, I've offered everything reasonable and what I'm suggesting makes sense, I think that's kind of your starting basis for that. Should the court grant that request and force my client to relocate, uh, that's going to then uh, push her into an effect where we have a 16-year-old child who's going to be commuting, potentially if you adopt his recommendation, for him right here over the bridge, across town, up I-5 to Kalama every day. And this is a child who actively participates in extracurricular activities. He's social. He does well in school. That is extremely cumbersome for any 16-year-old child, let alone one that you love like a son. So again, we don't think that's appropriate. Uh, he then provides you with information from Zillow, which I would suggest is hearsay. But nonetheless, if the court considers that, saying, well, Katie can go out and just rent a home on her limited income. And I'll get to that momentarily not recognizing the fact that he earns about six times what she does. He doesn't have a child who's, again, been involved in the Kalamazoo School District for as long as Logan is. Logan, that's the only real school he's known for the uh, past history, and suggests, well, you just go move, you start a relocation uh, matter with Logan's father. I know that's going to complicate, increase your attorney's fees and court costs. I really don't care because I want to live in the house with my dog. Uh, so again, if we're looking at that and looking at the last couple of months since these parties separated, I would say it kind of flies in the face of reason to make that suggestion. And that is uh, about as uh, egocentric as I think it, it, it traditionally comes. That's first and foremost. We are asking for a temporary award that my client remain in the home. Again, so Logan, if no other reason, can continue in school so that Logan can transition through this process, even though he's not under the jurisdiction of this court and this cause number, it's still a factor to consider because again, this is a child and these are parties who purchased this home and decided to settle in Klamath in large part due to Logan uh, attending school there. Uh, so again, that, that, that certainly uh, bears noting. If we look at the support issues, and again, this is, this is interesting. If you look at our original motion for declaration, we cited for you that Mr. Uh, Hilton, to his credit, is a field engineer for a successful company. He earns a significant income. We understated that in the original uh, motion for temporary orders. If you look at what was, provide, what was provided by him in anticipation of this motion, you'll see that he's on pace to make almost $315,000 this year. This man is contributing $3,000 a month into his voluntary 401k retirement contributions. That's almost exactly what my client takes home uh, in her capacities at Stewart Title. My client tells you as well that what she does is market-based. We are going through some uh, turbulent times right now with home mortgages, uh, and that affects my client. Uh, she tells you, and we provided you information that shows 2023 is not going to be as lucrative uh, for her as 2022 was, and 2022 was modest. She made about $58,000. She's on pace to make about 52 or 53, if memory serves correctly, this year. Meanwhile, her husband, who's contributing $3,000 a month to a retirement, who's making $315,000 annually as a field engineer, again, is suggesting she basically just take her child and move on, and he pays her $1,000, which isn't going to go far at all, so that he can reside in the home and essentially just kind of get rid of her. Now, we don't think that's appropriate. If you plug that $3,000 back into his net income, that bumps him over $18,000 per month in net earnings, and that is sizable and significant. 
These parties don't have a lot of debt. My client has a Cadillac car payment. She has some credit cards. There's the home mortgage, which includes the home equity line of credit. We're asking that Mr. Hilton be responsible for that on a temporary basis. We're also asking uh, for the transfer of uh, spousal support, again, to try to at least start on a temporary basis. And that's where we are, equalizing someone. We're never going to be able to do that. But at least give my client a little bit of a push so she can meet her monthly obligations, uh, so that she can pay on the payments that she needs to, and so that we get some kind of uh, not vastly disparate financial resources to these parties, but put them in somewhat like positions related to this. I will wait uh, in my reply to talk about the dog and the marijuana, but largely it's my client's position that Remy the dog is loved by everybody, uh, loved by Mr. Hilton, loved by my client, and loved by Logan. It's the family dog. I certainly understand how that is. I have an affinity for animals myself. My client's suggestion is just that we uh, basically do what they've been doing since August, and that's kind of just uh, if, if one party wants to spend time with the dog, he or she can, and the dog's available to Logan. As far as the marijuana in the home, my client was very surprised to read that. Now, my client uh, has, tells you that that's never been an issue. I would certainly submit that very much like the uh, allegation or the position of Mr. Hilton that the home is separate. We don't have a shred of documentation or information substantiating any of this, uh, whether it's Remy, whether it's marijuana, whether it's the home. It's basically all just what he's saying. My client is agreeable nonetheless to a mutual provision that nobody smokes inside the home, whether that's uh, cigars or cigarettes or marijuana or vaping, that if they're going to do that, they do it outside. And I, I, I think that makes sense. And we're in large agreement with that. Finally, we are requesting uh, attorney's fees and costs on a temporary basis. Again, given the vastly disparate uh, earning situation of the party, we believe this is appropriate. Uh, my client did borrow from her family uh, to retain my services. Uh, we are asking for $4,000 in, in temporary fees and court costs. That will get us through the discovery process, through the interrogatories, hopefully to a settlement conference or thereabouts where obviously we hope to resolve it then. But again, given the very significant issue related to the character of the home, that's anybody's guess at this very early stage uh, of the litigation process. We are asking that any award of fees, and again, we're asking for $4,000, uh, be paid within 60 days of entry of the temporary orders. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. One quick question, just to clarify the Logan, junior or senior in high school right now? Junior. Junior. Okay. Your client wrote senior in her declaration, correct? Error on my part, Judge. Yeah, yes. I, I believe she did say senior, but I, we anticipate this is going to be over by the time that we get to graduation or the end of the school year, hopefully. Great. Thank but you. He's a junior. Thank you. Ms. Dennis? Okay. Um um, yeah, so one of the biggest issues here is obviously the character of the house. Um, my client insists that the house is his separate property. He purchased it with funds from a premarital home that he sold, and he received it, the property as an inheritance. Um, it's very clearly traceable back to his separate property. He is the only person who's on the mortgage of the HELOC, um, which is contrary to what wife has indicated. Um, and he has provided me with that. I did not have it in time to file it. Um, but I do have the mortgage. He's the only person on it. Um, as far as the title documents that she has provided, he has indicated he had no idea what those were. Um, she works for a title company. She prepared those. He did not know what the intent of that was um, and what it would mean to say to convert it to community property. He just signed it because his wife gave it to him. And quite frankly, he feels like he was tricked at this point. Um, he's pretty upset about that. Is it, I think that, you know, regardless of who was on the... Is she an officer? Is he a, a title officer? I mean, is, is he a document preparer? I don't know. She, I, I don't know what she either prepared them herself or caused those to be prepared. So that's what he's represented to me is he did not know what that was. Um, and he feels like that was done intentionally to try and give her an interest in his home. But regardless, um, you know, the law also is clear that, you know, just because you she's a title does not mean you that, that, that is my reply. You, you can just jump in just if she's a title officer or not. No, she's not. She doesn't sign. She doesn't notarize. She doesn't do anything of that nature. That's completely somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dennis, for your patience. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, you know, it is his separate property. She cannot afford to live there. He works there every day. He was not gone for six or seven weeks, as he represented in his documents. He was gone for a short period of time because they were fighting. In the past, she has gotten violent and aggressive with him, so he moved out to let things cool down for a couple of weeks when he went to stay temporarily with his dad. Um, during that period of time, he was still at the house every single day working there in his home office. Um, his truck, his work truck is garaged there. Um, so he was never gone for a long period of time. He absolutely denies that there was any 
agreement where he was going to move out permanently um, or that she and her son were going to live in that house for the next two years um, until he graduates from high school. Um, her son is with her half of the time and with his father half of the time. Um, he does go to school in Kalama. His father lives in Woodland. So this child's already commuting 50% of the time. Um, so the argument that he can't commute from Rainier really doesn't hold water because he's already commuting on the other week and he's doing fine. Um, as far as whether or not she can move in with her parents, I mean, she has done that in the past when she was previously divorced. That is why he proposed that option. If that's not an option, he is willing to pay her a spousal support in a reasonable amount so that she can go out and find herself and Logan a suitable rental property until we figure out the disposition of the home and the assets here, at which point maybe she can buy herself a house. Um, so he feels very, very strongly about his need to stay in the home. I mean, he needs to work in his home office. He needs to keep his truck there. Ultimately, I mean, I think it will be proven that this is his separate property house. Um, and so she will need to find alternate housing at some point anyway. Um, she relies very heavily on the fact that she does have a child. Um, the reality is, you know, this is not my client's child. Um, and that's not to say he doesn't love Logan. He totally admits, you know, he has been a stepfather. He is concerned about the impact on Logan, but she cannot continue to live in that house. Um, she is not taking care of it. Um, she is smoking marijuana in the house. And he knows that because he's been there. I mean, we can't prove that because there's no you know, document for that. But he's been there in the house and he's seen her doing it and he smelled it. And he says the house now smells like marijuana. Um, you know, the dog has recently had a major surgery that's going to take several weeks to recover from. He again, you know, the dog, he says it's his dog. He's renovated a room for the dog. Um, all of these kind of adjustments in order to care for the dog. So there's a variety of reasons why he really can't move out of that house. Um, I think that, you know, we initially, and I'm not going to get into any details. I mean, we did initially kind of try to work this out outside of court with a settlement offer. Um, that was obviously not accepted. And then we turn around and we get this motion that I think if you look at her motion, it's pretty telling that I think she's angry with him. Um, and it's very, very much focused on money. Um, he does earn a higher income. That's very clear. It's a short-term marriage. It's eight years. I mean, some temporary support is likely appropriate here to help her transition out of the marriage. Um, but this isn't something where it's appropriate for her to just do what is essentially looks like a money grab. I mean, if you look at her motion for temporary orders, she's not only asking for spousal support, she's asking for him to pay the mortgage, the HELOC, um, you know, the homeowner's insurance, the property taxes, all of her insurance, despite the fact that they currently have separate insurance, they're not even on the same medical insurance plan right now. Um, so she's asking him to essentially pay all of her expenses, except for, I guess, maybe basic, you know, food living expenses. And then she's also asking for spousal support on top of that. And then if you look at her own financial declaration, she includes all the household expenses in her financial declaration while well, she's proposing that he pay them all. And even assuming that, you know, OK, we say her financial declaration is correct and we include all those household expenses and we have her pay those, her need is only about $500, even assuming she's in the house paying the mortgage, all of that. So her ask for spousal support is far higher than she actually needs. Um, and again, I mean, she's asking that he pay everything and pay spousal support, which is not consistent with the law. It's not appropriate in this situation. Um, I think his offer of you know $1,000, he even said he's willing to go up to 1,500 if she needs a little bit more to move out of the house. You know, He's not willing to let her live in his house and pay all of her bills for who knows how long this is gonna drag out. And I think counsel knows that. I mean, he's trying to stress, well, this is temporary, temporary, temporary. We all know that sometimes these temporary situations and these contested cases can go on for a year or longer. Um, and I think that's what this is, is she's trying to, she knows she's not gonna end up in that house. She's trying to stall for as long right, as possible. And your honor, I'm gonna um, and inevitably, to you're saying it's gonna end up, it's gonna end up you're back saying you know, speculation. Him, oh. she can't afford to keep it. So the right. objection is, is noted. We've got some delay. I apologize with the Zoom because um, Mr. Okay. <laughs> and then Ms. Dennis appeared to be just speaking on without having heard Mr. De Zandi, but because it was delayed and so she didn't hear. So, okay. So, so the objection is, is noted. It's overruled. Go ahead, Ms. Dennis. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> Oh, take your time. Okay. So, I mean, that's his position is, you know, she should move out of the home and he's willing to give her a reasonable amount of time to move out of the home. I mean, we understand she can't just move out tomorrow. I mean, unless she moves in with her parents, I don't know how that would work, but, you know, he's willing to give her a reasonable amount of time to get out, um, but he needs to stay in the home for a variety of reasons. He's willing to pay her spousal support so that she can find her own rental or something if she needs to. Um, he is asking that they each continue to pay their own medical insurance as they have been previously. They each have a policy through their employer. Um, he wants them each to pay their own car insurance. He wants possession of the dog. Um, and then they should each, essentially, as long as he's in the house, he'll pay all of the expenses associated with the house and the HELOC as well. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Dennis. Mr. Zendi, brief rebuttal. Yeah, and briefly to, to suggest this is a short term relationship again is not supported by a case law or the statute. This is an eight year marriage. They were together prior to that to suggest that my client, well, she knows that she's not going to be in the house on a, on a final basis again is extremely uh, premature and, and frankly uh, assumes things that just uh, are not supported by the documentation suggest my client is focused on money well rightfully so i mean this is a case in which mr hilton is making and these are net incomes per month eighteen thousand three hundred and sixty nine dollars compared to my clients three thousand eight hundred dollars per month yeah that's a gross disparity in incomes for the suggestion to be just figure it out and go find your own place to live and i'll float you what essentially i want to float you money wise when there's very little community debt outside some credit cards an auto loan and a mortgage is not reasonable. And again, that's not supported by statute. RTW 2609090 specifically discusses the standard of living. The fact that these parties have ventured together during the course of this relationship and to purchase a million dollar home to live in that, uh, again, is indicative to uh, an award of support at least on a temporary basis uh, and more than likely on a final permanent basis as well. But we're not there at that point. Goal of the court on a temporary basis is to somehow equalize the parties. That's what we're attempting to do. My client resides in the home and Mr. pays the mortgage on that. And Mr. Floats, uh, again, $2,500 in spousal support. He's still coming out far ahead on the monthly nets, uh, enabling him to work and do whatever it is that, that he wants to do from outside the family home. That's the request. Again, it's very reasonable given the circumstances. It's very reasonable given where we're at with Logan and his schooling and his success at Kalama High School. Uh, and again, this is, is, is kind of what, if you look at the pattern of conduct of the party since August 1st, Everybody agrees for a period of time, whether it was six weeks or seven weeks or less than that, as argued by Mr. Hilton, everybody agrees he left the home for a period of time. My client disputes the fact that she's ever been violent. Again, this is the first we're hearing of this, that she's ever done anything inside the home to lessen the value of that. Again, there's no documentation provided to that. And my client vehemently disputes that as well. This is where we're at. And there's a gross disparity in earnings. And we've got a 16 year old child who should not be forced to commute from Rainier uh, to school in Kalama, and we've got a situation where a 40-year-old woman, who again has, has taken her vows and devoted herself uh, to this man, who makes significantly more, to be forced to live in Rainier with, with her parents and just assume, well, maybe that happened 10 or 11 years ago, that should happen now. Again, that's just, that's that's frankly ludicrous. Now, what we're proposing, again, is certainly reasonable given the circumstances, and it is. It, it, it's temporary. We'll work towards getting this thing resolved. We'll work towards figuring out the character of the home. But all the information in front of you today, and we provided five different sources of that, shows that it's a community property interest. And the case law is clear on that, that if, if there's a dispute between the intent of the parties, uh, the court is to evaluate what is there as far as the hard, factual, concrete documentation. You've got multiple deeds, uh, you've got assessor's uh, page information, and you've got uh, loan uh, documents, uh, all that have been filed, which show that it was, uh, this home belongs to both parties. All right, thank you both for your, for your input and recitation and argument. Um, so the, here we have a motion for temporary orders related to uh, uh, spousal support, the home, use of the home, attorney fees, and, and property. I think the easy, uh, starting with the low-hanging fruit, obviously no, no change of insurance coverages and, and the like, those remain the same. And I think also low-lying fruit uh, would be that each party pays their own medical insurance through their employers the way they're doing now. That should continue. Same thing with car insurance. They each have, it sounds like vehicles that they can uh, insure and they should continue to insure those. Um, and I think that includes Mr. Hilton's list. He, he provided a, a variety of, of vehicles that, that will remain his property. Um, I think that includes the, the trailer, the Imagine trailer, and also the Mirage trailer. Uh, those, that, those pieces of property will re remain with Mr. Hilton, and he'll be responsible if there's any outstanding payment on them. Uh, Ms. Hilton uh, will pay for her, her, her Cadillac, and she'll continue to make payments on that and keep it insured. Uh, the snowmobile proceeds, um, just I, I guess a formal accounting would be appropriate. Uh, there's competing uh, claims as to the amount that it was sold for, uh, but there should be an, an accounting and any proceeds should be should be shared equally. The, um, the contents of the safe, I, I think that's an okay thing to do. It provides maybe a little greater transparency. So um, Mr. Hilton should provide uh, an accounting of the, the contents of the safe and provide that to, to counsel for Ms. Hilton. That seems appropriate. Uh, as far as the, 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 the animal, the dog, Remy, um, I think uh, I, I'm going to award the dog to the, to Mr. Hilton, um, and obviously there should be some opportunity. He, he should not be closed off to either Ms. Hilton or uh, the young man. Uh, I forgot his name, Logan. Um, Logan. 
seeing the dog. I think that's, you know, if they want to see the dog, that there should be reasonable accommodations for them to, to be with and spend time with the dog, especially after surgery. Um, so then to the, to the larger issues, uh, the issue of the home, I think that's, that's kind of the big elephant that's staring at us. The, the, there's obviously some questions and concern as far as the character of the home, whether it's separate or community. Uh, there's competing uh, inferences from the evidence that's been presented, you know, strong, strong evidence on both sides and how that, how that uh, shakes down, we're not sure at this point. One thing that seems reasonable that if there was a determination that the property is classified or characterized as separate, then it likely uh, Ms. Hilton would have to, to leave the home if the home is deemed as community. Um, and then there, there's some likelihood, although it's not certain in it by any means, that the home very well may be sold um, and then proceeds divided between the parties in some fashion, taking into account a lot of different factors. So given those kind of those probabilities and then thinking about um, the young man, Logan, um, does Mr. Hilton have any legal responsibility towards towards Logan? No. Um, are there some some maybe some moral obligations related to, to Logan's well-being? Probably. Um, and it sounds like they have a good relationship and hopefully that can be sustained and they can be of support to each other in their lives. Um, so so, you know, bottom line there that there, there's no legal duty to care for for Logan. There's um, evidence as far as the um, temporary absence of Mr. Hilton from the home. I'm not sure what to make of that other than uh, sometimes when parties are, are separating, uh, some distance between the two of them is, is a good thing, especially if you're living in the same home. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, it, you know, the claim is that he, he had manifested his intention as far as use of the home when he moved out for a month, month and a half or, or so. There's also kind of countervailing uh, evidence that he came back and was working in the home because he works out of a home office. Um, so th there's that issue. Uh, there's the issue of um, ability to to afford and pay for the home. You know, if if I were to say that Ms. Ms. Hilton stays in the home, we could certainly fashion something that would make it uh, that would safeguard the the home, making sure the payments are made and that the mortgage and the HELOC is, is satisfied. I'll note that the HELOC is is a relatively nominal amount. Of, I think of seven thousand. So all that said, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I think that um, kind of given that rationale uh, that there's some likelihood that the, the, the home would either likely be sold at some point in the future or that there may be a designation of either separate or community property. I, I am going to uh, indicate that the father, Mr. Pardon me, Mr. Hilton, can stay in the home and the mother would need to move out by November 15, November 15. It's roughly six weeks. Um, I think also in aiding that, I, I recognize that the, the Zillow information uh, it says thirteen hundred dollars in Longview. If the if they choose to stay in Kalama, my assumption is Kalama may be a higher rental area. It may be more expensive. I, I'm not sure. Um, I know rents are are very much in flux, and there's high demand. Um, and where they end up, I'm not exactly sure. But in as an, an aid to assist that transition, uh, Mr. Uh, Hilton will be responsible for paying for a deposit in first month and last month rent uh, with a cap of four thousand dollars. Um, that will allow for a, a transition, hopefully a smoother transition than otherwise would be. Um, if uh, she chooses not to, maybe chooses to live with her parents, then obviously that would be, um, could be held. It doesn't have to be immediate. I mean, if, they, if, they, if her, she feels like her need is, and her and Logan's needs are best met by moving back with her parents, then she can do that. And if there's within, within a one-year period, if she feels like she needs to move into an apartment uh, that's that's for the benefit of her she and her child then that first month last month and deposit would need to be paid if it's uh, occurred occurs within the first 12 months from today's date so that's as far as the the interim until that the move out date occurs uh, obviously mutual restraint on, on smoking or vaping uh, with inside the home and also a prohibition of any any damage i don't think that'll be an issue but that should be made clear that there's not to be any damage um, as far as uh, maintenance or spousal support, this is a short to mid midterm uh, uh, relationship. Uh, the standard of living, uh, you know, it was was comfortable. Um, I don't I see them uh, really scraping scraping by that they had a sufficient and and then some for their needs. Uh, the Ms. Hilton's need for uh, right now, she, you know, she's fully trained, I guess, in a, in a career. She's in in the title company business, um, makes a decent income. Uh, so it's likely that she would not be uh, 
incurring additional debt for education to go back to school or, or the like. That may be, but at this point, I haven't seen seen that that's her intent. Um, and the the obligations that she has, she'll she'll need she'll need rent. Uh, she'll need uh, those things as she transitions, and sometimes that can be challenging when you're going from a high level of income to a lesser income. Uh, so that's why I think there's that kind of that transition period. Uh, Mr. Hilton has the ability to meet his own needs and, and provide support. So I'll award $2,000 a month for 12 months of support, and that'll begin in October. With regard to attorney fees, I think there's a disparity of income. It sounds like the character of the home is going to be uh, where a lot of focus remains in this case. I, I may be wrong. Um, but I will award $4,000 of attorney fees that should be paid within 60, 60 days of today. So if she can't move in with her, we're assuming she can move with her parents. And I, I don't think that's possible. And I don't think we can obligate uh, a third party to, to do that. Sure. And she can't find any place. In, and I will say that Kalama is difficult to find any rentals in at this point. Uh, we're now in a position of Longview, Castle Rock, someplace in northern uh, Cowlitz County for that. You want to reserve on those issues if she makes, does her due diligence, makes a good faith effort to find something, but can't. I mean, I, I know the concern is not necessarily her. The concern, I think, for everybody is Logan at this point. And now we're forced into a potential relocation battle with Logan's dad, who doesn't live in the Klamath area either. So if she can't find anything in Kalama and dad's outside the district because he's in Woodland, we're going to tell a junior in high school who's doing extremely well, too bad, you can't go to Kalama anymore due to district policy, you're going to have to find a new school. That's, that's, I would like to prevent that. And she's looked in Kalama, it's very difficult to find that any place there. I mean, that's the concern as it pertains to, I mean, there, there's collateral damage to this that I would like to avoid and it's pretty significant at that. Neither parent now is going to live in the Klamath district. Right, valid concerns. And uh, I, I don't know exactly how to approach them, but I would certainly hear from Ms. Dennis. I mean, I think at this point, that's all speculation. And we don't have any evidence that she has looked for any other housing because up until now, I mean, she's been telling him, I'm staying in this house, this is my house. So I'd be a little surprised if she's actually been out apartment shopping. Um, I also think that, you know, we also need to know, you know, can they get a boundary exception? I mean, if he's a junior and he's been going there for his entire life or however many years, it's pretty likely if that happens that they're going to be able to get an exception for him to continue there if he's really this great student. Um, I, as far as the relocation issue, again, kind of a red herring. I don't understand how moving from Kalama to you know, long view when they're already a distance apart and they have a 50-50 plan. It's not like she's going to have to move to Seattle or something. I mean, it's not going to change the week on week off schedule. Um, the child drives, he drives between his parents' house. And again, not before the court, but also I don't think it's even a valid argument. Um, I can't understand why they wouldn't just be able to agree on that if she stays roughly in the area. Um, and I think that at this point, I, I just think I get it. I mean, she wants to stay in the house. So this is kind of a last ditch effort for that. Um, but I think it's just a lot of speculation. Um, you know, she's shown us nothing that she's looked for apartments. So to say that she's looked and wasn't able to find anything, I just, I don't even think that's accurate right now. Well, there are, that's part of the issue. There are no apartments in Klan. There are very few, and those are rented. And the relocation statute does apply because anybody, whether you're designated as co-custodians or not, you still have to give notice to the other side if you, the change is outside the child's school district. So it does apply, and that's right built into the statute. I'm aware, but I'm aware, but I don't, I don't really think that's a valid issue because it's even if she has to give them notice, it's not going to change their parenting plan. Well, it's not for Mr. Hilton and his dog, but it is for my client and her 16 year old son. That's that's the problem. Right. There's there, there's valid valid concerns on, on both sides of the issue, and and certainly the the concerns that Mr. Zandi raises on behalf of his client, you know, of relocation that 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 may be an issue, it may, may not. Uh, we, we don't we don't know we don't know so at this point i won't make any ruling related to that if there's issues that come up in the future certainly that can be addressed via motion but at this point those uh hopefully those concerns can be rectified and then that she can find appropriate housing for she and her her son any other questions or issues related to the motion uh presentation on the 24th that works for me miss dennis yes that works for me we'll set that date for october 24th at 9 a.m for presentation